What's the chair doing over there? Hello? Um, I think you forgot something? Thank you. Hmm. <laughs> I'm Michelle Nichols. I played Lieutenant Uhura on Star Trek, the original series. But that was a long time ago. In a galaxy far, far... <laughs> you know what I mean. You want to know the truth? It feels good to be back. And this lovely old ship hasn't changed a bit. I say we take a look around and relive some memories, okay? Follow me. Uhura wasn't the only great Star Trek character. I got to work with some truly wonderful actors. For example, DeForest Kelly. I like to call him D. His character, Dr. McCoy, ruled sickbay. <laughs> hmm. They're both in extreme pain. I sedated them heavily. I'm a doctor, not an escalator. What am I, a doctor or a moon shuttle conductor? May I help you? Yes, I'm here to pick up my prescription. That'll be one million quadrus. Hmm. Everyone knows Dr. McCoy was a great doctor, but boy, the copay was a bitch. Here's your prescription, Miss Hura, I mean, Miss Nichols. Thank you, darling. Thank you. Dee and I had fun, and I adored my other co-workers, too. Leonard Nomoy as Mr. Spock, Bill Shatner as Captain Kirk, and Jimmy Doohan as Chief Engineer Montgomery Scott. <laughs> wow, I'm not used to the engineering room being this quiet. It was usually a beehive of activity. The ship caught in some life or death crisis. Scotty coaxing all the power out of the engine that he could. And of course, Kirk always wanted more power. Scotty, I need more power. Scotty. Give me that power. And I need it now. And Scotty insisting, I cannot do it, Captain. Captain, we can't do it. I'm giving you all she's got. Give them all we got, son. <laughs> if only they could have found a way to harness the power of the male eagle. The ship would have had all the juice it ever needed. And enough left over to light up Las Vegas. Am I right, ladies? Mm -hmm. You're damn right I'm right. Woo! This is fantastic. That's my own seat. They say you can't go home again. Boy, were they wrong. <laughs> it's all coming back to me. Well, I think I'll have a seat. What you don't know is that this earpiece really worked. Whenever I was on the set, I had our tech guy pump it all in my favorite tune. <laughs> it's been over 50 years since I first sat in this chair. And you know what? I think it's high time a lady got a promotion. Don't you think so? Ah, that's more like it. Captain Uhura. I could get used to that. Take us out of orbit, Mr. Sulu. Warp Factor 5. We can't let Bill have all the fun, can we? <laughs> My first job in television was an episode of The Lieutenant. We were filming outside at night, and I got nervous when I noticed a creepy looking guy with red hair and a big hooked nose hanging around the set. 
I kept getting distracted by his, this weird stranger hovering near me, trying to make conversation. He was getting so close that his smelly cigarettes started to <coughs> choke me. I explained I had lines to study and asked him to leave me alone, but he just wouldn't go away. I complained to an assistant director, but he said, oh, he's harmless. He hangs out when a pretty girl is working. Just ignore him while well, I tried to ignore him until I felt him push up against me. That was it. I came within an inch of socking him right in the nose when I noticed something very odd about the way he held his cigarette between his two middle fingers. I only know one man who holds his cigarettes like that, and I yell, Mr. Roddenberry! <laughs> the director yelled, the crew started to laugh, the creep hangs out in his big fat nose and red wig and became Gene Roddenberry. <laughs> Ever the good sport, I joined in the laughter, though deep down inside I wanted to throttle everyone there but Gene, him. him. I wanted to kill him. <laughs>
Because of the wage structure of a day player, I ended up earning more than I would ever have had I been under contract. It was a win for me, a win for Jean and a big win for Uhura. You know the Vulcan slogan, live long and prosper? Well, you can live one day today and prosper too. <laughs> After Jean had finished filming the first Star Trek pilot, The Cage, NBC executives weighed in. They thought The Cage was too cerebral and lacking in action, their code for violence. What's more, two characters in particular left them cold, the pointy-eared alien and the intellectually gifted woman in charge of the ship. Number one, the suits wanted them gone. Then, this became the first of many conflicts between Gene and the network. Those people are overseeing Star Trek, knowing he couldn't hope to win on all fronts. Gene forfeited number one to save Mr. Spock. Then when it came time to shoot the second Star Trek pilot, where no man has gone before, I was hired. Bill Shatner was hired to play Captain Kirk. George Takei was cast as Sulu. James Doohan as Scotty and Grace Lee Whitney as Yeoman Janice Rand. And there was one other woman who joined our cast, Majel Barrett, the actress who the network hated as number one dyed her hair blonde and brought back by Jean to play Nurse Christian Chapel. And the suits didn't even notice Jean used to say, I compromised and the still one. I kept the alien and married the woman. Talk about a big win. Good for you, Jean. <laughs> even though I'd won a role on Star Trek, my role didn't even have a name yet. It was only after I came aboard that Jean and I created her, that Uhura was born. Jean and I agreed she'd be a citizen of the United States of Africa. Her name, Uhura. Mm -hmm. And that would be derived from Uhuru, which is Swahili for freedom. Uhura was far more than an intergalactic telephone operator. She commanded a team of largely unseen communication technicians who worked in the bowels of the Enterprise. Captain, receiving messages from a ground station. They stop broadcasting immediately. They do not acknowledge my contact signal. Uhura was a linguistic scholar and a top graduate of Starfleet Academy. Jean knew I knew where Uhura had grown up, who her parents were, and why she had been chosen over candidates for the Enterprise five-year mission. Many times through the years, I'd referred to Uhura as my great-great-great-great-great-granddaughter of the 23rd century. Do you know the old saying? You can choose your friends, but you can't choose your family. <laughs> I did both. During the first season of filming Star Trek, I was driving to work when I got into a bad car accident. Both my face and body were bruised and cut, and I thought, Oh no, there goes my career. I phoned the production office and I told them I needed medical attention. And so the first AD drove me to the hospital where a marvelous doctor examined me. And then he said, I had no internal injury. He told me I was going to need five or six stitches to close up a nasty cut on my lip. But he knew I was working on a TV show and, and he told me not to worry. You got me. You're not going to lose your job. You're not even going to lose a day of work if you do everything I tell you. 
and he gave me something special. A drug he smuggled in from Mexico. <laughs> and it worked like a charm. He warned me it would only last a day. And when it wore off, it really wore off. I thanked him and I went to work at the studio. By the time I got to the sound stage, I felt surprisingly well and was able to work all day long. But around 5.30 p.m., I was standing by the railing near Uhura Station on the bridge and suddenly I felt dizzy and off balance and I felt myself slowly falling far. Bill Shatner saw me start to collapse and he came leaping across the bridge toward me, screaming, oh, horror, and then catching me in his arms with my head just inches from hitting the floor. My God, she could have broken her neck. He looked down at me in his arms. Are you all right, Michelle? Yes, I slurred. I was so out of it, I couldn't even lift my head. <laughs> then, thank God for Bill. He insisted the director call it a wrap. Then Bill drove me home. And by the time I got to my house, I couldn't even walk. But Bill made sure I got home safe and sound. Then from that moment on, many years to come, Bill Shatner was my hero, totally in character with the Bill I would come to know and love during the first year of the series. Thank you, Captain Kirk. Having grown up as I did, I could not tolerate racist comments and actions. I've seen enough to know that what people really meant, regardless of how they tried to disguise it, you know what I mean? Then one day, I arrived at work and was surprised when the security guard at the gate, who had shown a subtle dislike for me and whom I knew by name, refused to let me in. What are you talking about? I work here. He said, sorry, hon, your name isn't on this list. Evidently, you don't work here no more. When I told him I'd been coming through this gate for weeks and reminded him who I was, he snorted, I don't give a damn who you are, furious. I drove down to the next gate and had to walk back some distance to the set. Then here's another example. We weren't far into the second season when Grace Lee Whitney left the show. I was very sorry to see her go. One day, a network assistant said bluntly to me, if anyone was to let go, it should have been you, not Grace Lee. Ten of you could never equal one blue-eyed blonde. I shook with rage, but I believe we all have the power to change our world. And I believe Star Trek offered viewers a valuable sense of mission. Man can change if he wants to. <laughs> then years later, the studio guard and the executive assistant both apologized to me for their racist behavior. Did Star Trek help to change the world? Near the end of Star Trek's first season, I was walking across the studio lot when two guys from the mail room stopped me to tell me they thought it was a dirty damn thing. What was happening to me? I thought, uh-oh. What's this about? They explained that they had been ordered not to give me my fan mail. I didn't even know what they were talking about. I get my fan mail, I said. He said, no, you don't. Not all of it. That's what they told me. He said, we have stacks, bags of fan mail that you never get to see. Why? Because certain people in power at the network wanted to remind me every chance they got that I was dispensable. How awful is that, right? And to think the mail guys said my fan mail matched the stacks they got for William Shatner 
and Leonard Nimoy too. Then one of the male guys whispered, you know, nobody can stop you from coming to the mail room to collect your mail. So for a few days later, I did. I saw myself all the boxes and bags of a horror fan mail from all over the country. So after the last show of the season, I walked into Gene's office and resigned. I told him, I just can't do it anymore. Gene pleaded with me to think about it first. I promised I would, but my heart just wasn't in it. The next night, I attended an important NAACP fundraising event. I was chatting with someone when a man approached and said, Michelle, there's someone who wants to meet you. He says he's a big fan of Star Trek and of Uhura. So I turned to meet this fan and found myself gazing at the face of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. And he said, yes. I'm the fan and I wanted to tell you how important your role is. Dr. King told me how Star Trek was the only television show he let his children watch and that they watched it faithfully and how they adored Uhura. I told him, thank you, Dr. King, but I plan to leave Star Trek. Oh. You can't leave, he said. Don't you realize how important your character is? Don't you realize the gift this man has given the world? Men and women of all races going forth in peaceful exploration, living as equals? He said, this is not a black role and this is not a female role. You have the first non-stereotypical role on television, male or female. You have broken ground. You have opened a door that's not to be allowed to close. You have created a character of dignity and grace and beauty and intelligence. Remember, you are not important here in spite of your color. You are important because of your color. Dr. King's words echoed in my mind as I weighed every factor. When I returned to work, I went to Gene's office and I told him about my conversation with Dr. King and my decision to stay on the show. <laughs> and a tear came to Gene's eye, honest. And he said, God bless that man. At least someone sees what I'm trying to achieve. He sure did, Gene. He sure did. I once had a secret I kept for a very long time. It only became public in the last years of Gene Rottenberry's life. You see, a long time ago before Star Trek, Gene and I fell in love. We spent countless hours together discussing everything from the civil rights movement and feminism to the feasibility of space travel. We even talked about ideas that will eventually become part of Star Trek. But despite my love and admiration for Jean, I sensed that our destinies were not to be together. Call it intuition. But one day he picked me up for lunch, a lunch date, and said, there's somebody very important I want you to meet. I said, oh, okay. Sensing something strange in his mood, we seemed to drive forever. I had no idea where we were going. There's something you haven't been telling me, isn't there? He nodded. Yes, he finally arrived at our destination and parked in front of a home in Laurel Canyon. The door swung open, and there stood Majel Barrett. The actress would go on to play nurse Christine Chappell. To Jean's surprise, Majel and I broke up laughing and hugged. Jean just stared, confused. You two know each other? <laughs> we sure did. 
So why had Jean brought me to Major's house? It turned out that Jean was in love with both of us <laughs> and didn't know how to tell us. This was his way of dealing with the situation. Afterwards, I told Jean, that could have been a disaster, Jean. You have to decide between Majo and me. But he said he couldn't. So in the end, I made the decision for him. I saw how Majo loved him. There was no choice but for me to end my romance with Jean. How could I just walk away from something Jean never quite understood? But I knew I'd done the right thing for both of us, and I never looked back. The famous Star Trek episode, Plato's Stepchildren, will always be remembered for the first interracial kiss ever shown on network television. Now, in the original script, Uhura was supposed to kiss Spock. But when Bill Shatner realized this kiss was historic and could generate a lot of publicity, he demanded that it be changed. If anybody's going to kiss Uhura, he said only half joking, it's going to be me. I mean, Captain Kirk. <laughs> I was so used to the daily rewrites, I didn't give the kiss much thought. It's not as if Jean announced that we were about to commit this provocative act. And since it was quite clear from the story that Kirk and Uhura was kissing against their will, I didn't see a problem. It was the last day of shooting, and we knew the kiss was scheduled for the end of the day. At last, Bill said lecherously, Laughing and winking, I always loved Bill's playful charm. But unfortunately, the director didn't share Bill's enthusiasm. It's as if the director had suddenly realized the kiss was going to be an interracial kiss. He panicked and said he wasn't sure that we should do it. Bill was livid. What the hell is the difference, he said. What does it matter? But the director decided he need to scurry to the front office to clear it with the big guys. And sure enough, the network suits began to get cold feet. What would the viewers say? What about the Southern affiliates? Jean told them, when you see the scene, you'll know it's not a love scene. It's being forced on them. But to appease the suits, Jean told them, okay, we'll shoot it both ways. One take where they don't kiss and one where they do. Of course, Jean knew exactly which take he was going to use and Bill Shatner did too. And since the kiss was going to be the last shot of the day, everything that took us into overtime would blow the budget and had to be avoided at all costs. <laughs> By the way, I always got a laugh at Star Trek conventions when I told Bill I was so professional, neither of us complained once through 36 takes. <laughs> when the director decided it was time to do the take without the kiss, it seemed to go so fine, and the director was happy and yelled, cut! Then the next day, watching dailies, we realized Bill had intentionally ruined the no kiss tape by wildly crossing his eyes. <laughs> it was awful. Everyone in the room cracked up. Finally, the guys in charge relented. To hell with it, let's go with the kiss. I guess they figured we were going to be canceled in a few months anyway. And so Plato's stepchildren first aired in November of 1968. The kiss stayed, and history was made. By the way, you've probably noticed how clean and spotless the bridge is, and that's no accident. You can thank the real unsung hero of the Starship Enterprise, Max, head of the janitorial department. Hi, Max. 
Hello. How you doing? Great. Max, it's Star Trek, not Star Wars. I, um, uh, I like the way it breathes. Really? Huh. Whatever. Would you mind cleaning out the cushion in the captain's chair? Every time Bill Shatner uses it, he leaves a mess. Do I have to? <laughs> yes, you do. Oh, God. Is this a toupee? Well, here we are, back where we started. And before I say goodbye, I wanted to share a little of what I did after working on the original series. I became a spokesperson and an astronaut. Hi, I'm Michelle Nichols. Recruiter for NASA, I work to find people of color, especially women of color, who dreamed of becoming American astronauts. In 1992, I agreed to host 13 episodes of Inside Space for the Sci-Fi Channel. My favorite episode featured Dr. Mae Jemison who had become the first black woman to travel to space aboard the Space Shuttle Endeavor. May told me how seeing Uhura on Star Trek when she was younger was a factor in her decision to become an astronaut. I am so happy and proud to count her as a friend. I want to thank you so much for listening to these stories from my life, as I had fun, and I hope you did too. But it's time for me to beam back to the mysterious, uncharted world we call Encino. <laughs> Here's one last little secret. Every time I sat down on my console at the bridge of the Enterprise, I felt like I was in the 23rd century, that I was Uhura. <laughs> the promise of that imaginary universe was real to me. I'm still very proud of Uhura, proud of who she was or will be and what she represented, not only in her time, but in ours. I'm Nichelle Nichols. End transmission. Guys, that means cut. Fine, whatever. Just do the sparkle glowing thing. I don't want to misjudge Judy. <laughs>